Welcome to the session. I'm mixing things up a little bit today. First of all, I'm working with pencil. And second of all, I'm going to be talking primarily about what I'm drawing. Most of these sessions have been about topics surrounding art and creativity. And this one, I'm just gonna try talking about what I'm doing, what I'm creating here. So a lot of this is gonna be about coming up with ideas and where my ideas come from and how I work through things. And so I'm hoping some of that will benefit you. If you've been liking these sketchbook sessions, please consider liking and subscribing to the video. It is tremendously helpful and I appreciate it as well. So what I'm working on here is a drawing of a deity. Uh, one of my storylines that uh, I've been working on for quite a long time has a pantheon that I've been kind of working with in the last couple weeks. And I started looking at Genesis and uh, Tolkien's Silmarillion as far as how mythologies are constructed. And so I started with a creation myth and started wrapping my head around how those things were going to function. And very naturally, like I think happens to very many of us, <laughs> us weird artistic folks, is then we find ourselves having to visualize it and having to illustrate these things. And so what you see here is actually like the physical form of one of these deities. And I conceive of these as being like the architects of the fabric of reality. So the way that I'm structuring the mythos is not really gods and deities like you'd think of in Greek or Roman mythology or even Norse. It's much more based on like the abstract concepts of the universe. So all of these deities, and I don't really know the term I'm gonna use for them uh, at this point. So at some point I'll come up with terms like the Valar or the Maya that Tolkien uses in his work. I don't have those terms yet, but they represent things like the primordial elements. So you've got earth, wind, fire, and water, like you would uh, in Avatar The Last Airbender and things like that, but also that you would have in a lot of other just kind of mythos and shamanistic cultures. But those basic elements then are also followed up with things like time, space, entropy, lightness, darkness, and then the biological components of life are broken into their own components as well. And so as I'm building all of this, I'm, I'm thinking about what makes these beings separate then from like the mortal races, the biological races that are going to get built later. And I felt like working from geometric ideas would be an interesting place to start. And so the heads of all of these have been squares and rectangles and triangles and spheres and ellipses because I'm trying to kind of hint towards humanistic biological components. But a lot of what I'm doing as well is just trying to, to point out something that hints at us, but is also tremendously foreign. And obviously we are biological beings and we've got certain quirks to our anatomy and structure, but most of how we're built is non-geometric. And so including perfect circles and ellipses and curved edged uh, rectangles and things like that is very counterintuitive to how we're built, but yet they're bipedal and they've got these components to them that are, are similar to us in some fashion. So you're getting almost this weird hybridization of um, the Celestials from the Marvel Universe and Galactus and kind of that idea. And I suppose that kind of makes sense because Galactus in, in his, uh, his origin is this being that existed prior to the Big Bang, right? So he's something that comes before. He's a progenitor to the reality that we know. Now, I don't think that he's really a deity per se, but he kind of is in his own way just because he's lasted that long. These are divine beings that I'm working with. They, they are actually, you know, unkillable. They represent comp, uh, concepts of the universe, but they are also like pieces of creation. They help to bring things into, into existence. And so I, I'm just playing around with those things. And then already you can see, like, I, I got that and it's like, okay, I don't really want to do the other arms. I don't really want to do the fingers or anything. So I'm going to jump over to another thing that's related to the same story which is this rock on the right. And I've, I've tried a lot of times to mess with this, this city and get it to turn out correctly. And I probably just need to dedicate a little bit more time to it because it is a pet project of mine. It's, it's something that I've worked on a lot of times and I've never quite managed to nail it. I can get it in sketch form sometimes to be what I'm looking for, but a lot of times I really have to, I, I have to put on a lot more energy. 
And stone and rock are hard for me, and so I can get them a little bit more accurately when I'm sketching with pencil or pen, but when I try to do full paintings of this, it's always difficult. The idea here is a city in the middle of a desert that is actually built to be underneath the shadow of this giant stone. So if you had a society that lived in a, in a town like this, that was at the base of a giant rock, and probably, presumably, equatorial or similar to that, where the sun doesn't change its trajectory in the sky very much over the course of the year, you could have a city underneath this rock that was in shade for a, an inordinately long amount of time during the day. Especially if it was built up kind of just against the underside of the rock and not, didn't expand very far out. And that's the idea, is this is a civilization that lives in the shade. They exist here because the rest of the desert is too hot, and so they exist in this one spot. But also, the other tremendous issue with living in the desert is moisture. And so this society harnesses dew as it forms on the giant stone form, which does happen. And there are, there are insects and there are lizards that do this. Um, and, and in fact, the guanaco do this on the, uh, the western side of South America where there isn't really any moisture that comes and lands in the form of rain. But what happens is dew forms daily on the mosses that are attached to the cacti. And so the same idea is pre present here, where the stone gets cool in the middle of the night as the temperature raises, then you get the limited moisture in the air condenses and forms upon the stone. And so the stone actually has these massive channels and grooves in it that take moisture and run it down the sides of the rock into vessels underneath the city. And that is then what uh, provides this civilization with their moisture, is they're able to store the dew every single morning from this stone. I like to sit down and try to figure out like, what, what can be stretched, what part of reality can be stretched. When you're building fantasy stuff or science fiction stuff, it's a lot of fun that you get to stretch yourself out of reality, but I kind of like to, to think, well, theoretically, could humans have done this if these megaliths or giant structures existed in our realm, could we do these kinds of things? Could we build these kinds of things? And I think that that's a really interesting thing to process. It's a really interesting thing to think about. So after my one take on the city, I decided to go back to working on these celestial beings, these divine beings. This one I started from a d dynamically different angle than the other because I have a tendency to work on things from the front. I think a lot of us do this because it's um, either what we memorize, it's what we look at, it's the easiest to diagram. But I'm often reminded when I do a piece from the front that like that doesn't stretch me, that doesn't grow me. And so immediately I decided to take that one step too far and you know instead of just doing it from a slightly different angle, I'm like, hey, let's go ahead and massively foreshorten this thing. So I started drawing this guy then from the top, and it comes together pretty quickly, and it's all right, but again, like, a lot of your little sketches like this are not gonna be great. They're not gonna be, um, they're not gonna be real good. You just have to learn by them. And so I'm already done with that one. I'm shifting to another one. This is sped up a little bit. It's at 200% speed, so, um, it just makes it a little bit more interesting, I think, for you all to watch, but it's also not ridiculously, ridiculously fast. Another thing I forgot to mention earlier, forgot to mention earlier, is the fact that they do have six limbs. They have four arms, and that's something that I'm kind of devising as being this uh, symbol of divinity. So all divine beings have this, and then there's going to be a race of these primordial creatures, which have existed far longer than any of the mortal races, and they, they try to artificially construct a secondary set of limbs for themselves because it, they, they're almost like the Tower of Babel. They're trying to become divine. And I think that that is going to be kind of an interesting nod to that, an interesting just component to their morphology and a component to their um, their their story, their life. So this one I'm building a little bit differently. Obviously, it still has the circular face. It's facing toward us, but the body shifted away a teeny bit. This is a more rational way of playing with the difference in perspective and not just working from the front like I'm so prone to do. Um, I'm also, I have, I've started doing this recently where I'm working behind my other drawings and just kind of letting things go and it gives me an excuse not to have to do the secondary arm. Um, and I think I'm gonna go ahead and start another one here soon. 
So again, we're back to the rectangular faces. And I like this idea. I like the idea of playing with what can you do and still have it have emotion, still feel like it's able to interact with humans and be, um, you know, be, be able to communicate with us. But it's also so different. And in my mind, this is uh, a more limited, less creepy take on the Lovecraftian idea of the, the kind of great old ones, these beings that are so far beyond us that we can barely interact with them without them just breaking our minds. And I like that idea. This is more of that with a slightly benevolent flavor. So these aren't uh, evil gods. These are really just, they, they don't care. They're not going to be able to interact with humans because... If you're a being that's sole purpose is to guide souls into the afterlife, or if your sole purpose is to govern how heat functions in the universe, are you really going to want to hear what some farmer thinks about you? Are you do, you, do you even have a, a way to interact with that? If your being is to sculpt stars into existence, what are you going to glean and what are you going to gain from acting, interacting with mortals? And so I do like the idea of, you know, like you see in some literature and some videos with interaction with, with Cthulhu, where it just kind of breaks people. And I like that idea, but like, what if, what if it wasn't an evil form? It was just, this is just a being that is so far beyond humanity that if it tries to communicate with you, it's just, you're going to have a migraine and you, your ears might bleed and you might need to, you know, kind of sit down for a couple weeks. And I like that concept. I like playing with that and riffing on it without it actually being like violent and uh, aggressive and evil. So the one that I just did down there is based on um, kind of my initial sketches for the one that's going to represent life. Um, I've broken life into three components right now, and that's birth, uh, healing, kind of sustaining things, and then also death. But they're all just forms of biological components, like uh, as they would be separate from things like earth, wind, and fire. Um, this one over here I'm playing with, well, what if, what if, you know, they, one of the divine beings decided it was going to try to get itself to be more biological? Like, what if you started to have forms on there that weren't just geometric? And so it's kind of gross. It's almost like the mouth is like pulling apart or opening, like on the first Matrix movie when Neo has his mouth kind of shut. <laughs> Not to disorient you, I have a tendency now to shift my sketchbooks like this because I, I want to use all the space. I'm paying for the space. It doesn't show up as well, perhaps, on video form, but the reality of a sketchbook session, at least for me, and what I'm trying to provide for all of you who are watching, is not a clever, beautifully put together thing, but like just the reality of what it looks like to sit down and sketch something. And so... That means that some of the things that aren't as pretty, like turning my sketchbook sideways, are going to happen. So what this is, is this is actually the city from earlier. Um, kind of just playing with the idea of looking at it from the top. Like, how would you actually store the dew as it's running down this form? And so I'm playing with the idea of maybe spiral forms would be really pretty to see from the top. Maybe they could be engraved or... Um, not not engraved, but inlaid with some kind of stone that was luminous, almost like the luminous stones are in um, in Breath of the Wild and in Tears of the Kingdom, where they light up at night. And you'll immediately start noticing, like, I drew a little bit, and now we got notes. And I do this a lot in a lot of my sketchbooks, especially where I'm brainstorming ideas that are going to be parts of things later, I take notes. And so if you don't take notes, I would highly, highly, highly encourage you to sit down and take notes. If a drawing goes well, notate why you think it did. If a drawing goes poorly, notate notate why you think it did. I moved too fast here in the video to actually read through that, so I'm going to go ahead and grab the sketchbook and I'll just read it to you. So this is what it says. If they are catching water like this, they need a way to get it down and off the rock itself. This configuration only allows for holes drilled straight through. So I was basically processing the idea that what I've currently laid out, uh, something where they where it had the spirals and it was pulling the water on top, would mean that, that you would basically have to bore holes through the rock in order to get it down. Now, is that the only way that that could function? Of course not. But um, in that moment, that's kind of what I was thinking. Is like this is what this implies, and so let's let's shift. And so that's why I'm uh, already doing another take on this. 
so this being from another angle, I think is gonna make it a little easier for me to kind of understand how it's operating. And you'll see another thing that I often do already right off to the right side there where I drew a little thing and then, I, because I knew I was recording this, I labeled this symbol. Normally I wouldn't do that. So that's one thing that's perhaps not quite as authentic as it would be under normal circumstances. But I usually try to pull symbols from the, um, the things that I design, you know, and try to think about the, the graphic design elements of societies and of, uh, of cultures. Partially because that's my background and then also partially because the iconography is important. It has been in our history. It's important in Tolkien's world. It's important in Star Wars. It's something that it's really easy for us as humans to identify with. So here what I'm working on is the idea of uh, as the water comes down, it drains on a slightly off vertical um, angle then from the side of the rock and it's able to come down into some reservoirs or something. And, um, you know, my note again is like, well, this create a stream of some kind. Like, would you have like running water? How would that work? And of course, now I've done a, a cutaway so I can see the side of the stone and you can see like, OK, so these are the clouds that's showing you where the sky is. And like if it rains, which is just it's not going to rain very frequently, but that's just kind of an indication for me later to indicate what I'm really talking about is the dew. I'm talking about the water, the moisture, the precipitation that comes down there. And then where does it go? And it comes off the stone into this reservoir underneath, which I guess would have to mean there's caves underneath the city, uh, and then smaller reservoirs up above. I do kind of like the idea of there being a cave underneath the city. It's just more interesting to kind of think about and explore. Um, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of interesting components there for sure. Well, as we continue on here, I, I jumped pages partially because I ran out of space and I jumped media because I was getting bored with what I was working with. At this point, I'm about 40 minutes in, 35 minutes into the session. And uh, <laughs> for me, anytime I can get myself to sit down and work for about an hour at a time is wonderful because I really struggle to do the same thing for any quantity of time. Uh, which means my daily schedule is just bouncing back and forth between things constantly. So a lot of these sketchbook sessions are conglomerates of two or three mini sessions often done in the same day. And that just allows me to work. So it's good to understand yourself, to know yourself, and what works best for you. So on this new page, I've started working on some thumbnails. These are for some larger scale pieces that I might want to do. It's also just because I need to work on composition. And so sometimes when I, I know I need to do some drawing and I'm not like, I don't really want to sit down and start a whole new project. I'll start with some things like this, where I'm just kind of sketching out ideas and getting myself some exciting little templates, exciting little thumbnails to potentially build things from. And I actually really like how this one turned out because it's the idea of taking one of those celestial beings and kind of putting it back behind uh, a landscape so you can get an idea of scale and it would give me some time to practice with atmospheric perspective and kind of taking some of the color tones out of things as they're moving back in space which is a lot of what I'm working on right now in my landscape studies is just trying to figure out like how do you make a landscape actually look correct so I like the basic idea of this one I know that the figure is centered depending on where I kind of create the edges but the graphic designer in me has a hard time not centering things. I like things being centered, and I know it's not great for composition, and I'm working on it, but <laughs> we've all got our tendencies. We've all got our, our natural propensities, and I have one to make things symmetrical and to make things balanced and to make things centered. And I know it's not great, and I'm working on it, and I'll keep studying more on improving my... Uh, um, oh, this is cool too. Yeah, I'm like thinking like, oh, how do I have the, how do I have it reflect in the water a little bit? And so if I do end up doing this as a larger piece, which I think I will, I'm going to play with that idea. Like make sure some of the water is in front of this celestial being. So I get to have the reflection of whatever color they are in that water. And the color will probably be chosen actually just based on whatever the opposite is of most of the other features uh, taking place. So we're going into another thumbnail here. And again, thumbnails are, they have mul they're multi-purposed. One of them is, it's a really good tool to work out ideas and compositions before you jump into something bigger. But as well, it's, it's a really low stress way to draw when you're just not quite sure what to do with the time you have. Because 
Obviously, to illustrate that whole picture on the left would take a long time, and if I wasn't sure it was going to work, and I put in 20, 30, 40, 50 minutes into it, and it's not going to work, that's that's a lot of wasted time. In this, you know, instance, that took two, three minutes, you know, maybe six or seven minutes to get that thumbnail down to see if the idea is going to work. I don't like the position of the hands, but everything else is going to work. So this image now, I am trying to play with uh, not centering the thing. So the character's almost centered, but I think if I did this, I would pull them over so they're in like the bottom third. And uh, I'm purposefully trying to play a lot around with that. And also having a lower horizon line and having the focus of some of the darker things be down there. This is cool though. This is one of the castles from uh, the same story. Um, I'm not, <sighs> it's, it's one of two castles. I'm not sure. It's either Zarkoza or Okazu but it's one of these castles from the story as well. And it's this really odd, like seven spindle design with these sharp edges. Very like Minas Morgali from uh, the Lord of the Rings films. And I did, came up with the idea of having the, the terrain in between them be all fog because I don't know how to do that. And so if I do this in a larger piece, that'll be a good thing for me to learn how to do because that's the goal with a lot of these things. The thumbnails and the bigger projects are designed specifically to help me improve skills that I don't have. And so these things give me the ability to do that. And that really is the benefit, the beautiful thing that thumbnails bring to the table, is it gives you the ability to try out these ideas before you really commit and dive in. Now, I can tell I'm getting towards the end of my attention span on this session because I've shifted format again. So I'm still thumbnailing, I'm working out a kind of sketching idea, but I have pulled it out of the bounds of the box. And so what I'm playing with here is the idea of kind of the supreme creator deity crafting the from the primordial components of the universe these deities that we saw earlier. And I get a few minutes into this one, or maybe just a few seconds into this one, and I kind of remember from my brainstorming that I don't want this, this god to have any defined form. The only thing that I've kind of described him as in the writing so far is that he has many hands. And so you can see immediately I go down that route where it's like, okay, there's four hands already on this thing. And if I was going to do this in uh, a capacity where I would put more time into it, I would actually uh, probably have six or seven or eight or may probably a, maybe an odd number because it's weirder, but I would have more hands. And then I've got the eyes kind of up off the side and riffing on the same thing that I have done with all the other ones. These pieces of symmetry and these geometric components that separate the gods and deities from humans, from mortals. So I'm kind of just playing around with those ideas and my solution in this moment with this really quick sketch and thumbnail was let's just have the eyes visible and then let's shade out so it's just like the eyes are coming out of a cloud. And that way I don't have to represent any body, any physicality, because I don't want to. I don't really want there to be any representation of this being in the mythos. I think that makes it a little bit more almost believable. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but, you know, if, if there are divine beings that sculpted, divine being or divine beings that sculpted existence, you know, if you look at the God of the Bible, for example, in Genesis, where he speaks creation into being, um, the ability for human beings to understand that deity just seems like it, it can't exist. We can understand those things on a hypothetical basis, but... If you have deities that are capable of sculpting planets, of speaking light into existence, uh, it just, it seems like hubris, like human hubris, to think that we would have the capacity to understand them. And on that very strange note, this sketchbook session is coming to a close, so if you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing. It's tremendously helpful for the channel and for myself. And uh, yeah, I just hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Please keep drawing, keep creating, and uh, yeah, have a good one, y'all. I'll see you soon.